Hello, and welcome to the Accountability Coach Podcast, where we discuss proven business success principles related to helping you make more money and work less so you can enjoy having your ideal business and ideal life. This is Ann Backrack. Today, we have a special guest with us who I believe has a great message for everyone to hear about the benefits of having even better health and fitness. Our health, as you know, is so important to be able to do what we need to do every single day and to help us achieve our personal and professional goals. Eric Degotti has spent the past 20 plus years in the fitness industry as a coach, a trainer, and instructor, pioneering his unique approach to training, client assessment, performance enhancement, and injury prevention. Eric is a guest speaker for prestigious organizations such as the Mount Sinai Hospital, New York University Medical, the Navy SEALs, the U.S. Army, Nike Camps, the Mayo Clinic, and multiple major universities. His list of training clients includes individuals who have been an Olympic gold medalist, All-Americans, national champions, World Series champions, and Pro Bowl athletes. He also works with many high-level county, state, national, and world champion sports teams, just to name a few. Welcome, Eric. I appreciate you sharing your valuable time with me today. Thank you for having me, and Looking forward to it. Well, I like to just jump right in and get the party started. So well, Let's go. <laughs> all right. How is our level of health and fitness actually connected to our ability to optimize our career performance. So how do they relate? Uh, it is all very much connected. Uh, the easiest way I teach people this is through a system called the triad of health. Now, it was actually created by somebody by the name of Dr. George Goodhart, and he created something called applied kinesiology. And not that I practice applied kinesiology or, or say good or bad things about it, but I stole this concept from him that I love. That is a triad of health, which is imagine a three-sided, equal-sided triangle where you have the foundation, which is your structural health, right? That's your muscles, your joints, the bones, uh, muscles, joints, the bones, the hardware, right? Then you have the other side is your chemical. That's the inner physiology of billions of cells that are changing over every minute we're sitting here talking. And then... Um, Last but not least, you have the mental side of things, and that's the thoughts and spirits that kind of tie it all together. Now, within that, there's things we can control and there's things we can't. Right? Yeah, I, I, at five six every day, I wish I was taller, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. So um, with that, I, I can control my structure through movement, either not doing movement. If I sit on a couch, I'll have a body built for sitting on a couch, or if I do certain movements like running or lifting weights, I'll have specific adaptations that come from that. But when I do that, I don't just affect one thing. So when you exercise, you, you know, you feel better. And so that's there's a mental aspect because endorphins are being released and there's all the, the things that, of rewards that come with that. And then there's also chemical changes that happen that change your physiology. So everything we do on all sides of the triangle all connect. And so if we're looking for great mental performance when we're on calls, when we're in meetings and so forth, we can stimulate that through the other sides. And so the most direct effect, as I said, on the structures is movement. Uh, the most direct effect you're going to have on your physiology is, is the fuel you take in in terms of food and uh, hydration. Um, and then the mental to, to fortify that side is that's what we absorb in terms of the people we hang out with, the TV we watch, the things we allow ourselves to be exposed to. So we want to have the best inputs to get the greatest outputs. And there's no way to isolate any one side of that triad. Super interesting. I really love this whole concept of health and fitness and how it really does help our overall performance just in whatever we're doing. So I think it's just really important. Let's just talk about what simple daily habits can actually change our energy levels and really our outputs then throughout the day. So I'm going to give one simple one that we take for granted and it's it is our lifeline literally is breathing. Right. It is an interesting thing because we have this system and not to go too deep into the into the woods of the chemistry and, and physiology, but we have this autonomic nervous system, which is the, the nervous system within our body that happens automatically, meaning that controls our blood pressure, our heart rate and so forth. And we have two sides of that system, which is our sympathetic, the fight or flight, where if a bear walked in the room, we want to elevate our blood pressure and heart rate and so forth because we're going to either have dinner or be dinner and it's going to get figured out pretty quickly. And then there's the, the the recover and reset side, which is the parasympathetic side. 
Well, we always thought we couldn't really control a lot of that, but breathing is the one hack into that system. And so it's something that we can control if we're right now. And as you're thinking about your breathing, you're probably, at, you know, if you're listening to this, you're thinking, okay, I'm paying more attention to, to how I'm breathing. Whereas up until this point, you already took thousands of breaths today and never thought of it. And we can manipulate that system in a lot of different ways through our breathing. So let's say we want to get into uh, what, what they, you know, people call the zone, or we want to get into this this type of optimal mental state where we perform at our highest. And, and that's not in that sympathetic fight or flight, right? That's a survival mechanism, but we're not going to make our best decisions always there. We're going to make our best decisions on a more even keel and what what it's also been called or termed as a flow state. And so to create that parasympathetic effect, that calming effect, we can do that through our breathing. We can lower our blood, our blood pressure and heart rate by just as simple, something as simple as three to six good deep breaths. And the key to that is two things. One is where the air comes in, right? Because we have two options. It can comes in through our nose or it comes in through our mouth. And then whether you exaggerate that inhale or that exhale. Now, if we take air in, if you think about that bear being in the room, you're going to breathe through your mouth. Oh my God, there's a, there's a bear here. So we don't want that. It's stress breathing. So we want to breathe in through our nose and we want to most of our focus of our breathing to be in through our nose unless we're in that high intense type of stressful situation. And then if we want to increase our energy, we would actually exaggerate the inhale. So take a big inhale and then a real short exhale. And if you do a bunch of those, that actually excites the nervous system. But that's not where we're going to make our best decisions if we're if we're going into a business setting. If I want to get in that calm state, I want to exaggerate the exhale. So if we were to breathe in for, say, four seconds, we'd want to breathe out for about double that, for about eight seconds. And something that became popularized actually by the Navy SEALs was what's called box breathing, which is you take a breath in for four, hold for four, and exhale for eight. Now, if you talk about the, the ultimate stressful situation, if you're a Navy SEAL sniper, you need to be able to make really good decisions and be sharp. So that type of breathing is what they do to get into that flow state. So the first thing I would recommend is using your breathing. And if you're going to get on that big call, you're going to go into that big meeting, or you're just feeling like you're overwhelmed, something as simple as just taking a pause and doing six to 10 of these concentrated exhale breaths in through your nose and then back out either through pursed lips or back out through your nose will completely change your physiology and get you into a better mental state. Yeah, I want to be like a Navy SEAL. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? I actually had the great opportunity and to, to, to work on two Navy SEAL bases and instruct workshops on there. And they are a very special breed. Um, and they are the elite of the elite. And unfortunately, a lot of us go and, and, and we go to fitness magazines and say we want to do a Navy SEAL workout. Uh, there's a reason why they are the elite of the elite. And, and most, ca most couch potatoes have no business even trying to do what they do. And most of what they do actually is not what makes them SEALs. It's what thins the herd and basically eliminates the ones who are, who are not meant to be SEALs. Yeah, I can't even imagine a couch potato trying to do a Navy SEAL workout. Those two just don't seem to go together in my head anyway. Not in the least. <laughs> so, you know, many times I hear comments from my clients anyway about, you know, and I just don't have the time or I just can't get my exercise in or there's, you know, just not enough time to get to the gym or time in the day. So how does a busy professional fit a workout program into an already overloaded schedule. Okay, so this is where I'll take the the blame and fall on the sword for my entire industry. The fitness industry has done a really bad job of explaining to people what fitness is. And most people have this concept that I don't have the time because it means I got to drive to this special building. I have to, you know, fight to get a parking spot. Then I'm going to have to wear a special outfit that I got to get changed into. And then I got to go on special machines with blinking lights and feedback to tell me if I've done this right or not. And I have to be there for an hour and then I have to shower and get changed again and then go. And, and that's a huge undertaking if you're trying to figure out where to squeeze this in. Whereas something as simple as just, hey, I'm going to go for a 10 minute walk this morning. And then I'm going to go for a 10 minute walk at lunch. And then I'm going to go for a 10 minute walk after dinner is going to make a much bigger impact than you trying to go do this one super 30 minute workout. And they've actually done research where they took people and they said, go do a 30 minute workout. And then the control group is going to go do, or I'm sorry, the control group did 30 minute workouts. And then the other group said, we're going to put you into three 10 minute workouts. Now, not only did that second group get the same results, but they had better adherence 
And, and, and so the, the effect was more long lasting because they were able to stick with the program because the best program in the world is the one that you're going to stick with. And so we've intimidated everybody out of exercise because we made it into this thing that it has to, you have to go to this special place and you have to do these special things. Well, that's crazy. You just need to be able to go out and move. And so something as simple as walking can have a profound impact. And if that leads to your walks are a little more aggressive and turn into hikes or a jog or some sprints or a bike or something, that's awesome. But you need to get small wins and make that part of your, what I call your non-negotiable habits every day. And the industry that, if my industry screwed it up, I'll tell you the industry that got it right in is the dental industry. I've never had anybody, and, and you could tell me if you've heard, had any of your clients tell you, has anybody ever said to you, you know what, you know what's really killing my schedule and my productivity is this time I spend brushing my teeth. It's twice a day. It takes minutes out of my day that I just don't have, right? Nobody says that because they have sold us on the idea and not an improper uh, sales, but they've sold us on, on the idea that you need to do this thing as a proactive, you know, a measure to make sure that we don't have problems with our teeth. And we have all bought in and we buy into it when we never really challenge it to say, well, what if I didn't brush my teeth? Is it, are my teeth really going to fall out? But we do that with, with movement all the time. And so if we just said, this is part of what you do, so you don't have to deal with the issues that come later in life with immobility or um, lack of balance and control or the ability to, to have the freedom to do the things you want to do throughout the day. So what we need to do is just like brushing your teeth is kind of a non-negotiable habit you every day, some form of movement should also be your non-negotiable habit. And it doesn't have to be contained to a gym and you don't have to wear a special outfit or have blinking lights to tell you you did a good job. We just need to go out and move. No, I love that concept of just short 10 minute walks. I, so many times I've had my clients also say, well, you know, Ann, I couldn't get my hour in, so I did nothing. And it's like, well, something is better than nothing. Even if you did 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it's still better than nothing. But because they had this whole hour wish or dream in their calendar and they didn't get to it, they figured, oh, I'll just cancel the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater a little bit there. Exactly, it is, totally. So give me an idea of how I would assess my current state of health and see where maybe I need to improve the most or what would be the first or second thing I need to do. Can you help me with that? Yeah, so I have a talk that I do and using a system that I call the three big things, right? Is that so so many times we get super granular and we grasp for straws for that one magic workout or diet pill or, or nutritional tactic that that's going to be the answer when those are are pretty far down the line and we need to to take a few steps back and take the 10,000 global 10,000 foot global view first. And I say there's three big things we got to check. Number one is you got to move. Are you doing some sort of movement? Any type of movement is better than no movement. Um, and then obviously within each one of these three things, we can then get subsections and then the next big three things underneath that. So when we talk about movement, are we doing stuff for strength, stuff for endurance, stuff for, for better movement and mobility? Okay, so we have these subcategories of each, but you get at least get some form of movement. So we can argue over beer and peanuts of what that best workout is, but we are all going to agree that you need to have some sort of movement. So that's the first category is movement. Are you getting any kind of movement? And then from there, we can get to the subcategories. Are you doing something to move better? So you have freedom of movement and good movement competency. Do you have something that challenges you to improve, to improve your capacity um, in terms of not only building strength, but also physiological and aerobic capacity? Now, that's the first bucket. Now, your second bucket is fuel. That's what you put into your body, and everybody just assumes that's nutrition, uh, which is a huge component of that because we literally are what we eat. Every cell is made of proteins and, and uh, sugars and fats that are from things we've eaten. So that's one part of it. Fuel is also what you let into your body and not, and also your brain. So your fuel is, are you, what, how much time you spend on social media, what TV you're watching, the people you're surrounding yourselves, what you're letting yourself get exposed to. That's the fuel that's going in every day. And, and that's going to have either a positive or negative effect, just like every food we have has a positive or negative effect. So we have to take inventory on garbage in, garbage out. How much garbage am I letting in, whether it's, you know, I'm eating it or whether I'm seeing it or whether I'm listening to it. Then the third thing is reset, is that the people don't understand how basically the system works is that every cell in our body 
has one job. It's to survive another day. And so we have all these adaptations, some of which I talked about, that are there in place naturally to survive. So if it was really cold, we'd shiver to warm up. If it was really hot, we'd sweat to, cold, to cool down. And so if you lift weights, your body says, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to build some muscle and, and you know, reinforce the nervous system so I can better uh, lift those the next time you do it so I can survive. That's how you survived as a species for thousands of years. But the growth that we experience is not happening when we're doing that thing, whatever that may be. The growth happens from the reformation and, and the adaptation that we do in response to that specific uh, stressor. And so if we, we get this stress, we need to be able to then give the body time to kind of learn and adapt and, and grow stronger from that. Well, if, if we don't allow ourselves to reset, now the number one reset is sleep. And there's an incredible book that I've recommended to, I can't tell you how many people that have, cha that is literally, they've said changed their lives. And it's a book called Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker. It talks about the impact and importance of sleep on our everyday performance. And it goes into how it affects the workplace, how it affects our school systems and how our students are learning. It, 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 it's a fascinating book. So sleep is number one. Um, on that list. And then other terms of reset is, do we have the ability to stop, like I said, and breathe and, and, and sit in quiet and kind of, whether it's, it's meditation, whether it's just some deep breathing or just being able to refocus, can we reset? And if you don't see any time in your day where you have the ability to reset, well, then you're just, you're just putting that pedal down. And what you're doing is you're, you're buying energy on credit, right? It's like going to the mall with that, that shiny new credit card, buying a whole bunch of stuff that you know you have no way of paying for when that bill comes. And so if you don't have the ability to reset, well, that's going to affect our ability of how hard we push. And um, I steal a, a line from Tim Ferriss. I, I had the uh, good fortune of meeting, meeting Tim Ferriss. He's a, you know, if you, those who are not aware who he is, he's a New York Times bestselling author, has one of the top podcasts for years and years now. And I got to meet and work with Tim and he talks about, you know, we have, if we there's zero to 10, 10 is like all out, you know, I'll use my analogy again of the bear in the room. And then one is we're just sitting there meditating, right? Is that we, unfortunately, most of our lives, we never really get to nine or 10. We don't really challenge ourselves that much. And we also don't have the ability to get to, to one or two. And so what we do is we diet what he calls a simmering six, right? Where we have this low, slow, you know, burn that just, slowly kind of kills us over time and we don't have the ability to, to become resilient because we never push ourselves to the eight, nine or 10. And we don't have the ability to reset because we never go to one or two. So if you take inventory of your life, say, do I ever get to eight or nine? Do I ever sprint? Do I ever run and jump or, or really do something challenging? And if you don't, well, then you're never going to become a, a more robust organism. And do you ever reset? Do you ever just unplug? Can you sit quietly um, for just two minutes without your phone, without a TV, without any distraction? And if you can't do that, well, that's that's something to take inventory of and figuring out how am I going to fit that into my life? So it's, it's again, just to review the three big things. Number one is move. Number two is fuel. Number three is reset. No, I love these. It's super, super important. I totally agree, especially about the reset and recharging your batteries and unplugging. And I can't tell you how many times I talk to my clients about sleep, you know, because most people, according to sleep experts, at least that I've heard, most people go through life sleep deprived. And you can't be 100 percent if you're sleep deprived. There just doesn't work. Uh, I, I mean, I preach to my athlete. There's so many different, you know, uh, uh, repercussions of, of undersleeping. And uh, I tell my athletes, your reaction time goes down. So it's going to it's going to affect your performance. They found that athletes are injured more often um, when they when they're underslept. And it's so important in the world that I work with, with working high level athletes that you, the um, the premier soccer clubs in Europe, there's a, actually higher sleep experts that if you're work if you're playing for one of the top soccer clubs in Europe, there's actually someone that goes in advance to the team hotel and sets up your room to optimize your sleep from everything from the how the room is set up to the lighting to the temperature to your bedding. Everything is set up to optimize your sleep because it's that important. Uh, the high, the professional teams have changed, you know, from the old mindset of we're going to get up early and get after it to letting people sleep more. There's nap rooms now in most professional organizations in their in their clubhouses. In and now how that carries over into into the rest of the world is is like I talk about students. So in in Dr. Walker's book, he talks about where they just changed school start times an hour, and what they found was 
um, standardized test scores went up significantly just by changing that start time an hour. Now, if you think about the ripple effect that has of the kid who maybe was on the border of getting into college or not getting into college, who now gets that higher score, or the one who is the difference between getting into a, a good college or a great college, like that's life changing. And now, you know, that you just put that in any aspect of life. Sleep is insanely important. It's not just the, the number of hours, but the quality of your sleep. And so there's a lot of things you can do to, to change that from an environmental aspect of, of the sleep environment you put yourself into, as well as uh, habits that you have in your pre-sleep pre routine of things that will make a significant difference in your, in your sleep quality. Well, wow, that would be cool to have somebody come to your house and set up your room for optimal sleep. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> well, go go make it. You know, a couple. You know, be a, a couple million dollar athlete that that uh, is affecting a billion dollar franchise, and they're they're not taking anything to chance. Yeah, no kidding. I love it. Well, let's talk about. Well, you mentioned injury just a few minutes ago. So a lot of times people say, okay, well, now I'm going to get busy. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to start exercising. And then they have injuries. So what are some of the best protocols to potentially deal with muscle injuries and really speed up the recovery time then? Okay. So the, the, the mistake that's often made is the, the traditional model right now is in Western culture is something hurts, your, your back being the most common thing. And low back pain is actually the number two cause, only second to the common cold for people calling out of work. Uh, musculoskeletal injuries in general um, have now become the number one claim with most insurance companies, which is pretty scary when, that, when that's surpassing cancer and, and heart disease and all these other things. So, the, but the traditional model is you're gonna go to a physical therapist, chiropractor, something like that, and they're going to treat your uh, source, you, you know, your, your, wherever it hurts, right? If your back hurts, they're gonna heat and stim and ice and poke and prod and rub and give you exercises for that area. Um, meanwhile, for most people, that is not where the problem came from. Meaning that um, unless you got checked into the boards or fell down a flight of stairs or were in a car accident or got tackled in a game like, there's most of the times it's your body breaking down because it can't handle what you're asking it to do, whether you're asking it to get in positions or postures that you weren't ready for, or you're asking it to do a workload that you weren't ready for. And so with that, if, if you go in for this treatment and they don't ask you what led up to this, then you're, they're just going to give you palliative remedies that'll feel a little bit better for the time being, but now you, you have to go back and, you know, two more times that week to feel that way again. And it's generally not long lasting. That's so on the front end, we have to find out where is this coming from? And, and you need to kind of get a full evaluation of how well you move and a little, and as well as your history, meaning it, it, there's a big difference if I'm working with someone coming in with back pain that has a history of being a, um, an athlete their entire lives versus someone who's been more of a desk and chair type person for their entire life. And then I also have to know on the opposite end, what environment are you going back out to? And, you know, I've had athletes who come to me and say, you know, I went for, for physical therapy and it was really frustrating because I went in for my shoulder to get treated and I'm doing the same things that there's, you know, an 80 year old lady sitting next to me who has a frozen shoulder. Now I throw a ball 95 miles an hour. How could we be doing the same thing? Um, so there is no one protocol that I could just rip out of a cookbook to say, well, if your back hurts, do this. And I can't tell you how many times I get a text, a phone call or somebody meets me uh, in an event and they're like, hey, could you have some stretches for my low back? And my first question back is to say, well, how do you know you need to stretch? Because what if I stretch you and I make it worse? Because that can very well be the case that there's a reason why your back is hurting. And if it's something in the, in where I said before is where it's just insidious and it crept over time, then I got to trace back the steps and see what's the root cause of this. Because I've had people have low back pain because of because of they had a stiff ankle. I've had people have low back pain because they have poor control of their 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 pelvis and their trunk. I've had people low back pain that had nothing to do with their movement that it was actually a medical issue, that they had low back pain because of a cancerous tumor. So it, to just say, hey, here's your magic stretches to fix your low back, it's not that simple. But if you go someplace that just tries to make that area feel better, you're, you're probably going down a dead end street. And what ends up happening is that is going to open up the, 
the floodgates to something else happening. I just had a, a, a guy come in who's a high level executive yesterday who had a, a, a significant back injury, had surgery. And then he said, since then, it's been a cascade of all other things that have started to go wrong from knee to shoulder to, to hip pain that he's had because they never addressed the root cause of things. And they also never really addressed the environment he wanted to go back to. He's a, he's a competitive weekend warrior. And, and unless you understand the demands of what he was putting his body through, you, you can't really treat that injury with its due respect uh, until I know all these factors. I know. It's so amazing. Don't get me started on physical therapists. <laughs> now, that's not to say that there can't be huge value in that. I, my, my brother's a physical therapist. So my, my, my greatest friends and people I work with and refer to every day are physical therapists. It's how do I sort out and know the difference if you're the lay person out there that's not in my world? And I say that the best way to know if you're in the hands of the right clinician co or coach or fitness person is the ratio of questions to answers. If you walked into my office, you're going to you're going to find out that I'm going to ask. I always joke that I ask, I'm like a four year old. I'm going to ask way more questions than I am going to give you answers, because if you walked in and, and, and you said, hey, what can I do to get more fit? I don't know. I have no idea. I need to find out why you're fit now and I need to know what do you need to be fit for. And then from there, we're going to dive a little deeper and dive a little deeper. So if they're not giving you a lot of questions and they're just giving you answers and those answers in the form of, hey, these, this magical treatment or these magical stretches or this magical workout is going to fix you, the chances are that that's, that's not going to hit the mark. So they need to find out about you and what got you to here. And, and that's the first question I ask anytime I meet anyone is, is why are you here? And then what got you to here? And then where do you need to go? No, I love physical therapy. I have unfortunately had about 16 surgeries, so I have a physical therapist who's absolutely amazing. But I've met a lot of physical therapists who are not amazing and don't really do a whole lot to fix you and ask a lot of those questions. So and I, my profession I mean, is just as guilty, I, you know, because I, I part of a big part of what I do is doing continued education for fitness professionals and strength coaches and trainers. And, you know, we're guilty of it as well. There's 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 more than one time that I've been teaching and I turn to my my assistant and say, you know, I don't know if I would train with anybody in this room. But that's why it's important if you find a good one to hang on to them, because it's, it's extremely valuable and it can it can be life changing. I, I would 100% agree. And speaking about trainers, I totally agree with you on that, too. I mean, I go to a private gym, but I still see private trainers teaching people to do things that my physical therapist said, you should never do these things, no matter who you are. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, these people are going to be hurting soon. <laughs> it's just not not a not a consistent field. Right. Well, part of the challenge is that we and, and I'll, I'll again, I'll fall on the sword and take blame for it is, is we we allowed the bar to get sit pretty low. Um, I, one of the questions that I always ask and when when uh, after I found out, OK, well, why are you here is I'll say, how do you know if I've done my job? Like, how do you know if you've gotten a good workout? And what do you think the answer is? Ninety nine point nine percent of the time. I don't know what people would say it's, to that. I, so here's what my answer that I get 99% of the time. It's really hard and I sweat a lot. Okay. And then number two is I'm, I was really sore afterwards. And that's what their expectation is. And so I, you know, I, I turn that around and I say to them, I joke, I say, all right, well, I got the perfect program for you. And I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. You don't even have to pay for this program. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to show up at my house this weekend and I'm going to give you a list of things to do. And you're going to mow my lawn, you're going to mulch, you're going to pull weeds, you're going to clean out the garage, you're going to do all these things. And I guarantee you, you're going to sweat a lot, you're going to be sore, it's going to be really hard. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And I say, well, if that's all you wanted, right? And so I say, we need to set the bar a little higher. And so the, the answer really should be of what makes a good workout or a good physical therapy treatment or, or a coaching session is that either one, I can walk out doing something that I couldn't do before, or two, the information or the things we've done, that the information I've learned or the things we've done is going to allow me to do something I've never been able to do before. And so that's the, the bar that we need to set. It shouldn't just be we're a dispensary of exercise and you're here for exercise entertainment or we're just here to rub your shoulder and make you feel better. 
We're here to make a lasting change that's going to allow you to be the person that you you have the potential to be and that you want to be. I love that. Absolutely. So how would somebody learn a little bit more about you, what you do, how you can make a difference in their life? Sure. So the easiest hub to catch me at is just my website and I make it simple. It's just my name. It's Eric Degatti, E-R-I-C-D-A-G-A-T-I dot com. And there's a couple things on there that, that you can get started with. The easiest thing, since I do a lot of public speaking and uh, in shows like this, is that I created an Ask Eric button where you just click that and ask me a question about you know health or fitness or performance that goes right to my email and I'll do my best to turn that around with an answer or, or and if I don't have the answer, I'll give you a resource where you might be able to find that. Then the other thing you have on there is on my media, you'll have my former other podcast appearances. You'll have my social media. I post probably once or twice a day, different tips on training, on fitness, on all of the different things that we talked about. And so I try to give and share as much information as possible and, and pay it forward. So that would be a great place to start. Awesome. And I totally love the concept of paying it forward. I agree with you 100%. Any other parting great words of wisdom for us? I think the, the the biggest things that that people don't get because they're again they're looking for this magic bullet is number one the best programs create awareness all right and that awareness like if you were to come in for, to me tomorrow and first thing we're gonna do is a, is a pretty thorough evaluation and that evaluation is going to be looking at your your movement competency and, and your baseline physical capacities and so forth but also asking you a, a bunch of key questions to kind of find out you know what got you here a little bit about your past kind of find out about your present and then where you're looking to go in your future so things that are going to create awareness to say wow i never realized that I, uh, you know, my left side is way tighter than my right. I never realized the impact that sleep has in my life. So awareness is number one. So things that create awareness are going to be the things that are going to start change. The second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, is establishing non-negotiable habits. And there's a great line from a, from a book that I once read that talked about the, the, one of the reasons people are so fearful of change is because their former, they basically have to allow their former self to die. And so what that means is you have to recreate the narrative of who you are. And part of that is those non-negotiable habits. And, you know, we talk about this person say, hell, those those people, that's just part of what they they do. If they're a runner, they just they know they're going to that person is going to get their running in. So for you have to decide that this is going to be part of who I am and what I do every day. And so those decisions and those non-negotiable habits are going to be incredibly important. So. First, build the awareness of where am I at, where do I need to get to, how did I get here so I don't make those mistakes again, and then two, what are the non-negotiable habits I need to make part of my every single day so every day I can be the best version I can be of myself. Um, those are the two biggest keys. Now, whatever you plug into those, those are the little things, right? That's why I say three big things first. All the little things can plug into there, and that's where you know a, a good coach or a clinician or you know can guide someone to say, well, here's the the details uh, of that and the more granular stuff of 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 the of what those tasks are going to look like. But we need to take big picture concepts of of how do we build awareness, how do we build habits that are going to allow you to to become the most high performing version of yourself you could be. And that, that high-performing version of yourself is physical, mental, emotional. I mean, it's the full Monty. You know, we're not just talking about one-sidedness here. So I really think that I love, love, love the fact that, hey, establish or create non-negotiable habits. I think that alone is amazing. Yeah, and you cannot separate those three sides of the triangle. You're going to always affect all of them, and every decision we make is either building or breaking down one of those sides. So uh, taking inventory of, of your decisions throughout the day and figuring out what what am I doing to build my health and then what are the things I can remove and, and to that are hurt, holding me back, that's that's critical. Well, thanks again for sharing your very valuable insight and your time with us. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, my hope for our time together with Eric is that you got some value and an idea or two or three or even four that will help you be even more successful personally and professionally. Feel free to share my podcast with others as it can be found on most podcast platforms and in most English speaking countries. And if you'd like to get a short daily fix from me, 
subscribe to the Accountability Minute, which can also be found on most podcast platforms and in most English-speaking countries, as well as on accountabilitycoach.com. And remember to subscribe to my Proven Business Success Resources and Tools blog by going to accountabilitycoach.com forward slash blog. And always aim for what you want each and every day. Until next time, make it a great day, today and every day. I appreciate you listening.